I just discovered that uh, Haripriya comes from my native town called Chikabalapur, my mother's place. <laughs> so, that's the place where we are now uh, setting up the leadership academy. It's fifty kilometers from Bangalore. Namaskara Sadhguru. Namaste. It's so nice to be interacting with you. Thank you so much. No, I think it's a waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> Your presence makes all the difference. <laughs> Thank you. See, I want to mention this. Uh, I have actually never believed in uh, any gurus or uh, any Swamiji's. I've always felt my mom is my first guru and my teachers and my directors who of course directed me in all my movies and of course life experiences. But later when I started watching your videos, it makes so much sense and they are so practical. Everybody can apply to their own lives and um, I can look at you as a father figure. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. So uh, for a few of my questions or a few of my confusions, your interviews have given answers. Thanks to you for that. Mm -hmm. And from then onwards, I've started following your all the speeches, all the interviews. You inspire a lot of people and everybody can relate to them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Firstly, <laughs> I would like to ask you that uh, everybody would be coming to you with a lot of questions and with a lot of confusions. Sadhguru, in Madhbeku, with Madhbeka, Ath Madhbeka, Atmanandi, Tara Kastaire. So, you will be explaining the Lord. So, Atma, you will be analyzing their problems and you will be giving your explanation. And you will be traveling the Lord. And you will be giving a lot of interviews. You will be doing a lot of interactions. But have you ever felt, I need a break, Atma, I am exhausted, Atma, I have to take some time out for myself. And, um, this is question like, a father, I mean, a daughter asking her father about his well-being. Hey, Gidira Sadhguru, how are you, Anta? I want to ask you first because I'm going to eventually end up asking my questions. Because even I have my questions and confusions. I'm going to end up asking the same. But before that, I want to know, how are you? Roaring. <laughs> <laughs> I go blank, seriously. I remember one incident last year when I met Sadhguru. So after talking to him, I wanted to take a picture. So I asked him, Sadhguru, can I have a picture with you? He said yes. And I went blank and I was just sitting idle. Okay. He was like, stupid, you're an artist. To take a picture, you have to come sit here. Then I realized, yes, I have to get up and go sit beside him. <laughs> I was just sitting opposite him and I was just looking at him and I was lost. Seriously. <laughs> and a um, few questions I want to ask you. So in that, the first thing would be, I have been working since I was 16. So it's been 12 years of my journey and uh, Work has become my routine. I've been working every day. Like I've completed so far like 39 movies or something. So when I get a break for a week or 10 days, I feel restless. I know that I would be starting another project after a week for sure. But still I would be able to enjoy only those 3 or 4 days. After that, I feel like I'm doing some mistake. I have to get up and do some work. So I'll start doing all the work at home and still they'll be some time left and I feel so jobless. So, how do I overcome this restlessness about my rest? <laughs> See, if you... if you come to ease within yourself, And above all, if you're genuinely doing something that you really care for, why would you need a break? Those people who are doing things that they don't care for, 
they're always looking for a break. Thank God it's Friday, that's a culture. <laughs> and they tell me, some surveys say that seventy percent of the Americans hate their job, not dislike, hate their job. So five days of a week, if you're doing something that you hate, you think those two days are going to be fantastic, but that's not how it will turn out. If you want those two days to be fantastic, at least you must practice five days how to make it fantastic. So, this is the fundamental, in many ways, this is the very fundamental that we're talking about. What I'm normally addressing is just this, that what you call as myself is right now a collage of things that you do. People say, this is me, but what they mean by me is their home, their work, their wealth, their property, their this, their that, so many things. They're a collage of things. If you are a collage of many things, obviously there is no substance of your own or it has not been found at least. So this is why spiritual process that if you simply sit here, you are still worthwhile. For this to happen, you must get the order of things right. Say you have a body, you have a mind, but all these things you gathered from outside. So there is something called as you, that you right now if you want we can call it just life. If you put body in the forefront, it will always want to do a few things. It wants to eat, it wants to sleep, it wants to reproduce, it wants to die. It's all body knows. It'll always be wanting to do something regarding that. If you put your mind ahead of everything else, <laughs> well, it just doesn't know what to do. It'll simply scratch you all over the place <laughs> because most of the time it doesn't know what to do. If you put your life in the forefront and body and mind to serve the life, that's how life should be. That you have a body and mind to serve this life. But right now your life serves your body and mind. Most people, their entire arrangement of life is just about their physiological needs and psychological needs, that's all. To settle their physiological needs and their psychological and emotional needs, their whole arrangement of life is just around this. But the most significant aspect of you is you're alive, not that you're a body, not that you're a bundle of thoughts. The significant aspect of your life is that you're a living being right now, that is not even in the experience. So, both the body and mind will feel very inadequate, particularly the mind will always feel inadequate, because it's trying to run its business with a very small bubble. Your mind is just a little bubble, small things you have gathered, with that you're trying to make a big nonsense about yourself. So always it'll feel inadequate, it has to do something. So to come to ease, that if you sit here you are at total ease, then where is the question of a break? This is a break? Hello? Since morning we've continuously worked one, two, three, four, five events, but this is a break. Right through the day it's been a break, I've been on the motorcycle, what better break? So, why is it first of all, people are doing things that they don't care for? Because they think they'll get something. If you're doing something that you don't care for, naturally it'll be burdensome. When life is burdensome, whatever the hell you get, what's the point? But to get that point, uh, most people are on their deathbed. So I'm trying to see if we can make, make them get it a little early <laughs> so that there'll be some worthwhile human beings to at least be with and interact. <laughs>
this is again a personal question and uh, many girls would want to ask this question for sure <laughs> um everybody say that okay you have to get settled down in life especially when it comes to a girl or women's life you have to get married and settle down so for that we have to find our soulmate soul i mean the partner life partner <laughs> soul, doesn't, of, like, soul doesn't need a mate it's only the body which needs a mate okay so the better half like whoever we get married to oh you're calling him the better half <laughs> oh, that's nice to know <laughs> i'm the best half so <laughs> he's the better half <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I forgot my question Sadhguru <laughs> I've been working since many years and I have given more importance to my career so I have become very workaholic so I haven't given much attention towards my personal life so uh, now when my mom asked me to okay you have to settle down now so uh, I have to choose the person but now I've got into a place where when a guy is looking at me so I'll, i'll have a confusion there okay is he looking at me okay this is a good looking girl or he might think okay she is an actress i want to go get a selfie with her or there is a little wrong notion that actors or actresses are little easy okay we can go get them so with what notion he is looking at me so i don't give them even a time to understand me or know me just i talk to the point just go from that place So then, how will I know anyone other than my workplace? <laughs> And most of the successful women, um, I'm reading about this scenario nowadays. Most of the corporate women or most of the successful women, so they're not able to come out of their comfort zone. They're not able to interact with men comfortably because we don't know with what intention they're looking at us. You just ask him. <laughs> <laughs> True, but um, what if their answers are not genuine? <laughs> See, yeah. Uh... <laughs> The thing is, uh, we have learned how to make a problem out of everything. If we have no success, we'll make a problem out of that. if there is success we make a problem out of that one problem is uh, in a way the question is uh, are they coming to me as a person or are they coming to me because of who i am so uh, anyway you're taking those week long breaks uh, you must go away to a place where they don't know who the hell you are then you may find a man <laughs> if you are in karnataka maybe they all know you so maybe it's just a fan moment <laughs> it is a, it is a dilemma that both men and women are facing today because in this culture at least are everywhere for that matter marriages were very stable though within the house a whole lot of turmoil happened for many people still they were stable because one thing was let's say if you look back 100 years ago there was no way a woman could live alone It's simply out of question she had to have a man to protect her otherwise it was just not possible so she would anyway stay another thing was there was no economic freedom so she would stay there would be no social status so she would stay another thing is the moment man and woman met there would be children so she would stay 
Now children you can choose whether to have or not to have. Financial freedom you may have by yourself, you made your money. Socially it is no more a problem, you can live by yourself. Law protects you, you don't need your man next to you to protect you. So all these things have disappeared. So the only other things are an individual human being's psychological needs, emotional needs and physical needs, which should make them go into a marriage. The nature of human being is such, one's physical needs, psychological needs and even emotional needs don't stay stable. This moment it may be strong, tomorrow morning it may not mean anything. So because of that, the very institution of marriage is in a big question mark right now. Unless somebody falls in love with somebody and it means a lot for them to be with someone, just as an institution, it is a big question mark right now. Unless two people really bond together and marriage or no marriage, it means a lot for them to be together. Unless that happens, simply for needs, getting into an institution because you have a certain need, those needs are no more the way it was. So, in a way, the whole… S the whole human societies are at crossroads because without the stability of man-woman relationship, because when human children are born this way, see if a tiger is born, for him ninety percent is natural instinct. Ten percent is education by his parents. But for a human being, only ten percent is by instinct, ninety percent is by education. So, when you are born, well at least fifteen, twenty years you need nurture, care, support. Even now your mother is traveling with you, all right <laughs> wherever you go. But if you are any other creature, Within a few days or weeks, you would just walk away because for them, most aspects of life are naturally, instinctually built into them. Only a little bit of learning, but human life is not like that. A whole lot of it is learning. So because of that, a stable marriage has been vital for the growth of individual human beings. See, today you are a grown-up woman and you are thinking like this, but when you are a two-year-old child, the stability of marriage was very, very important. I mean, your parents' stability, isn't it? It was very important and valuable. But today you are thinking on those terms. So these are a civilizational crossroads. In, in a way, the whole human species is going through this right now. Uh, you have to go through it too <laughs> But uh, how do I choose? That's why I said you must be in a place where they don't recognize you. And um, about developments, so do we have to concentrate on the developments or the preservations? I think the development See, or uh, preservation. Preservations. Nature. Yes, Nature, yeah. Because uh, now for the transportation, for an instance, for, the, for an example, the transportation, we need roads and for the railways, we have to cut trees and we have to plant somewhere else, but people aren't forgetting that. So, now we are with you, joining your campaign and all. But still, the preservation also, like how can we do both at a time? We have to develop as well as we have to preserve. See, uh, these things need not be seen as contradictory. We can develop, we can make amenities for the people who live here. At the same time, we can still maintain very nat rich natural resource. It is just that it is done in an unplanned and unbridled way, that's a problem. There is no larger considerations when we are doing a project. And another problem is, there are activists who simply protest against everything. Already some people have started Kaveri calling how it's the worst thing to do 
So by the time we go to Tamil Nadu, it'll pick up. <laughs> so they will always be there. So because of them, also the policy makers tend to do things underhand sometimes. Simply because if you announce these people will anyway protest, these people will protest every damn thing. If the roads are blocked, they will protest. If you try to make… enlarge the road, they will protest. Everything they will protest because they are making a life out of activism, that's their profession. So they have to be protesting something to be seen, so they are always protesting. So policy makers' hands are kind of forced sometimes to do. Well, there is of course corruption, there is of course other things, all those things are there. But what we need to understand is, say uh, everywhere I go, people are continuously telling me, Sadhguru, you're talking about rivers, but you're not talking about sand mining. They don't know a thing about sand mining, believe me. They just read some nonsense in the newspaper and they're talking. We have already made it, built it into the Rally for Rivers policy that it is perfectly okay to go into the river and take some sand. If you're doing it by hand, by spades or pickaxes, you're taking some sand, it's not a problem. Only if you take large-scale machinery into the river basin and start digging it up, it's a problem. So we suggested a policy which most probably will be implemented because it's already a recommended policy, different states may start implementing it. So we suggested below three thousand square feet, that means a simple home that somebody is building, they can use river sand. Any major project, they must use manufactured sand. Only thing is, when we pass the law, we must give anywhere between twenty-four to thirty-six months for the industry to come up. So suddenly you ban sand mining, everybody says ban sand mining. Well, I've built my house, I'm happily sitting there, you come here to build your house, now you say sand will ban the sand. What will you do? You will uh, go to that fellow, that contractor and say, I will give you double the amount, please get me some sand for my house. So he will go in the night, he will… this all happening. In the… he will take the truck in the night into the river bed and dig it up and bring it for you and he will charge you three times. First time he'll give you double, second uh, sand, second piece of… Uh, second truckload of sand you want, he'll, he'll say three times or four times. Now you have built your ha ha house halfway up, you'll pay whatever damn thing <laughs> that guy asks. Now, suddenly sand mining becomes so super lucrative, no law can stop it, any way they will do it. So, in policy we can set it up in such a way, that everything can be controlled. If there is no long-term policy, all short-term knee-jerk things, ban this, ban that, banning anything is not going to work. If it's lucrative, well, people have banned drugs all over the world, but it's one of the biggest businesses. Because it's so lucrative, somebody will somehow do it. So you can make… similarly you can make… they've made sand also very lucrative. They will anyway go and take it in the night, do what you want. Nobody is going to guard the entire length of the river day and night, day and night. Somebody will find some place to do it all the time. So the important thing is, development is needed because the same people who complain about ecological damage, they also complain about lack of development. They are using everything. They're using lights, they're using refrigerators, they're using air conditioners, they're using everything. But they don't want power stations, they don't want anything to come up. How will it happen? Okay then, let's turn off the lights, all right? Let's turn off the lights, live in a very ecologically… Shall we do this tonight? Hello? Very eco-sensitive life you have in the night, you will… you will know what it is. If these lights are not there, uh, this is elephant country and you're sleeping in a tent, <laughs> all the best <laughs> So, it's always nice to go on talking about this. See, we have identified in this country, largely we've identified what's a reserve forest. 
then no way we should touch it, it's finished. That part of the land should be left. But now you talked about the project, the significance of this project is this, most people are still not understanding what I'm saying. We are talking about tra raising large-scale tree cultivation in farmlands, in this land. This is somebody's land, see they've plowed it obviously. In this land you can grow, but when… suppose you own this land, why would you grow a tree if you cannot make use of it? You will grow it only if you can make use of it, isn't it? So this is all. If you make it lucrative for the farmer, he will grow it. If it is not economically sensitive, sensible, nothing will succeed. Right now, this plan is economically sensitive to all the people concerned, to the farmer, to the government and to the larger public. For everybody, this is good. It is lucrative for the farmer, so he will want to do it, but he needs some support. Government is willing to do it. But government needs some revenue, government will get lot of revenue from this in the form of taxes. What they will not get on agriculture, they will get on tree cultivation because they can't tax agriculture in the country. But tree cultivation, timber can be easily taxed. So they will get revenue. People will have assurance of water and better life in the country. And above all, we are importing 70,000 crores worth of raw timber and 1.2 lakh crores worth of timber products. So, if you are… everything in the country, let's say you want a piece of furniture, it'll cost much less if it's grown here. Right now, most of the wood that you see in any new building is all imported. How much imported wood costs and how much the local wood costs, it will benefit you tomorrow. You want to build a house tomorrow, you'll have, you know, reasonably priced timber. You don't have to buy imported timber. So in… in a way, it benefits everybody, that's why it'll work. One thing about food, I'm a foodie. <laughs> I'm a foodie. Foodie? Foodie, yeah. I love to eat. So, during shoots, yeah, I avoid, but when I'm at breaks, yeah, I hog on food. But <laughs> I'm an animal lover too. <laughs> oh. So that's why you eat them. <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. When I see some incident, when somebody no, people say I love my food, huh. so you love animals, so you put them in the food. No, I've tried many a times. Like, okay, I have to quit eating non-veg. I have tried that also, so I've stayed away from non-veg for a week or ten days. But the minute when I see somebody having non-veg, I'll be like, okay, from next month. I don't know. I, I, how do I come out of this? Like. Of course, like even I have two pets at home and uh, I don't know, like what do you say Sadhguru about this whole thing, this non-veg and not eating non-veg? When are you planning to eat the pets? Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> they're like my babies. <laughs> and that's what they say, even I've seen people talking to the chicken and all very nicely. And next week they'll eat them up. <laughs> Are you a vegetarian or non vegetarian? I'm a humanitarian. Humanitarian? <laughs> <laughs> Today there's substantial documentation to show that. Plants are as sensitive as any other creature. So whether you eat a plant or an animal or whatever, it is still violence. Only thing is they don't scream. They do scream, you don't hear, that's all. There's enough evidence to show that they do scream. It has been recorded like this that if, uh, let's say, an animal comes, see, among the, among the trees, let's say there are, let's say a thousand or ten thousand trees here, let us say an elephant came and starts eating the, the leaves of the tree, 
immediately this tree will send messages to all its species that it is being eaten by whatever. I don't know whether it'll recognize an elephant or not, but it is being eaten like this. And within minutes, if the elephant goes there to the other trees, the, all the trees would have produced a certain amount of poisonous material in their leaves. When the elephant tries to eat that, it will sound… it will taste bitter and it's poisonous, so it won't touch. So among themselves, there is that much sensitivity. So whether you pluck a fruit or a vegetable or cut a animal and eat, everything is cruel. It is just that we must do it with some sensitivity, only to the extent it's necessary. You should drop this idea of being a foodie. We all eat food. We must eat food, otherwise it will be cruel to this one. But becoming an identity with food, not right, because that means we will indulge, we will not just nourish ourselves. We have a right to nourish ourselves. As a life, we have a right to nourish ourselves because this is how the food cycle is in the world. But we don't have a right to wantonly take another life just for pleasure. We have no business to do that. We have every right to nourish this life, but we have no right to enjoy taking another life. So, don't call yourself a foodie, because food should never become the identity. For survival, for nourishment, we will eat whatever we have to eat, given the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhguru. Thank you so much.